Hello, and welcome to our discussion of chapter three in human biology, which is entitled Cell Structure and Function. This is going to be the first of three videos that uh, deals with the cells and cell structures. Now, why are cells so important to human biology? Well, the answer is that all living things, are, including human beings, are made of cells. As a matter of fact, your body is composed of over 100 trillion cells. That's a lot of cells, all right? And they all have to work together in order to keep you uh, functioning on a homeostatic level. Now, um, there's lots of living cells out there. There's bacteria, there's archaea, um, we have protists. Uh, which are all single-celled organisms, then plants, fungi, and animals, which are multicellular organisms. And so there's a big difference there. Um, the, the one thing that I will point out is that viruses, including the coronavirus that is, uh, has been so much in the news lately and has disrupted all of our lives, um, is actually not alive. Viruses are not alive. You can't kill a virus. It is simply a nuclear, uh, a nucleic acid, a piece of RNA or DNA that's surrounded typically by a proton, uh, protein coat. Um, and the reason that viruses aren't alive is that they don't carry out the life processes. The only thing that they do is reproduce, all right? They, they actually hijack uh, the cellular machinery uh, in, and make your cells co make copies of the virus, like a little Xerox machine. Um, Okay, so cells, as you may remember, come in two different forms, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are very small and very simple, no real major internal structures, whereas uh, eukaryotic cells, which are the protists, um, fungi, bacteria, and plants, or I'm sorry, fungi, plants, and animals, are, um, are eukaryotic cells, much larger cells, with uh, the organelles that we're going to talk about throughout the course of chapter three. Now, this brings us to the third level of the hierarchy of uh, life's organization. We uh, remember in the last chapter, chapter two, we dealt with the first two levels, atoms and molecules. Now we're dealing with cells. And this is, an, this is a momentous step up because now for the first time, uh, at least in this course, we're actually talking about organisms uh, or things that are alive, all right? Molecules and atoms are not living things, but cells are technically alive, whether they're from a unicellular organism or a multicellular organism. Oops, wrong way. So one of the major theories in science is called the cell theory. And the cell theory has three major parts, all right? First, it states that a cell is the basic unit of life. In other words, all living things are made up of cells, whether they are unicellular organisms like bacteria and protists, or multicellular organisms like fungi, plants, and animals. Um, and the third and final point of the cell theory is that new cells arise only from previously existing cells. In other words, cells don't spontaneously uh, come into existence. They have to um, have a parent cell, all right? We'll talk about the reproduction of cells uh, later on in the course. But for now, it, it's enough to know that um, cells must come from a previously existing cell. Okay. Now, cells are very small. All right? As a matter of fact, most cells are uh, microscopic. You cannot see them without the uh, aid of magnifying lenses, all right? for, of the type that we would find, for example, in a microscope. All right? and the there's a good reason for this, all right? And the reason has to do with a mathematical relationship called the surface area to volume ratio. Now, if you are dealing with a cell that's, let's say, this big, okay, versus a cell that's only this big, all right, if you um, then 
try to diffuse a material into or out of a cell. And let's say that um, a molecule of oxygen can diffuse this far in one minute. All right, well, it's going to take two or three minutes in order to get to the center of this particular cell. But in this cell, we're already at the middle. And no matter where you start from, you're already there. All right. And so the small size of most cells deals uh, is, is uh, there or is, is in existence because that high surface area to volume ratio allows for more nutrients to pass into the cell and wastes to exit the cell. And it allows this to happen very efficiently. The larger a cell becomes, the smaller the surface to area the surface area to volume ratio becomes and it becomes much more difficult for a cell to survive because it can't diffuse uh, oxygen and nutri nutrients in and it can't get rid of carbon dioxide and other metabolic wastes and so there's a limit just uh, to how big a cell can be and still be able to be uh, efficient and metabolically active <coughs> Excuse me. Now, let me illustrate how surface area to volume works in a given cell. Let's say for the sake of argument that you've got a cubic cell. All right, so it's got six sides uh, and the length of, whoopsie daisy, the length of each size, side is one. So we got one, one millimeter there, one millimeter there, one millimeter there. Now, the surface area of one side is going to equal one times one, which is one square millimeter. But there are six sides, and so the total surface area is going to be six square millimeters. The volume is calculated as length times width times height, so one times one times one is still now one cub cubic millimeter. Uh, and so that's the volume. And so the surface area to volume ratio in this case is six to one. Now, if I double the length of each side, so I got a two millimeter side and a two millimeter side and a two millimeter side, all right, and I calculate the uh, surface area of one side, it's two times two or four square millimeters. But there are six sides, so six times four is 24 square millimeters. Now, if I calculate the total volume, it's two times two times two, or eight cubic millimeters. Now the ratio is of surface area to volume is 24 to eight, which reduces to three to one. And so the ratio has now gotten smaller. So the larger a cell gets, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio becomes. And that is uh, that decreases the efficiency of diffusion into and out of a cell. <coughs> so let's say we have a large organism that is one four centimeter cube. All right, so four and four and four, um, and so the total surface area is going to be four times four, which is sixteen uh, square centimeters multiplied by six sides is 96 square centimeters. Total volume is four times four times four, or 64 cubic centimeters. And the ratio of 96 to 64 is 1.5 to one. If I take that same organism and I divide it into eight equal sized cubes, which are each two by two by two, then the total surface area uh, is now increased. It's actually doubled to 192 square centimeters. The volume is still the same. It's 64 cubic centimeters, but the surface area to ratio, uh, volume ratio has now increased to three to one. That's a good thing. More efficient diffusion. If I do the same thing with each of the eight squares in this picture and cut them into each, uh, into eight squares, whoops, uh, or cubes rather, I end up with 64 one centimeter cubes. All right. And um, now the total surface area becomes one times one times one um, times uh, six is six, and six times 64 is 384 square centimeters. The volume is still 64, 
now the surface area to volume ratio is now six to one. All right, and so you can see that the smaller a cell is, the more efficient it can be at diffusion because it's got a much greater surface area to volume ratio. Okay, so here is a YouTube video dealing with surface area to volume ratio. Um, obviously, you can't click on this through the video that I'm showing you that you're watching right now, um, but I have posted this PowerPoint to Canvas, and so you should get into that PowerPoint, open it up, and click on this hyperlink and watch the little video on uh, surface area to volume. All right, it will be uh, quite helpful, I hope. Now, um, in the last video, I talked about the list of important things that was going to be very important for your final exam. And here, I'm going to add a second item to the list of important things, and that's going to be the surface area to volume ratio aspect. Right? We talked uh, in Chapter 2 about the building block molecules. In Chapter 3 here, we're talking about the idea of surface area to volume ratio. And of course, as we've already stated, it has to be high for efficient diffusion of materials into and out of a cell. And that generally means that a cell has to be small in size. The smaller the cell is, the better, the higher the surface area to volume ratio is. Okay. So that is the end of the first of three videos on cell structure and function. Um, and I hope that you found this helpful.